So very good morning class. So we're going to continue with our conditional statements and iteration. So we, we actually looked at the if statement. And uh, did you do on uh, else if? Have we done on that yet? So if statement is what we can actually use on its own. Right? We have actually done this before. We define a variable. We assign it to a value of uh, 120. And then we can actually place a condition. Remember that the colon is very, very important as well as the, the indent, the tab space is very, very important as well. So if it fulfills this condition, then it executes this particular statement. So of course, in this case, if we define as 120 and if the mark is more than 100, then it will print invalid marks. So we have done this before. Now, as I mentioned, the colon is very, very important because that is what separates from the condition and also the statement. And also it must be indented. Take note that uh, the statement must be indented and must be in intended in the same spacing for all the statements. So Python is quite sensitive with that. Uh, if you don't in uh, do the indentation correctly, then you'll get error. So this is where we actually started to use the method input. Right? Whenever you use a particular method, the method always comes with the name and also uh, round bracket. Right? Uh, if it's small, just let me know. I can make it big. This one, input. So whenever we use this method input, this is actually a predefined function of Python. So it, it allows the user to enter an input. But whenever you, whenever it receives an input, it actually converts it into string. So here, the statement is actually now checking in terms of integer, right? So we use integer to convert the string into integer. And then of course, if it uh, fulfills this condition, then it will print invalid marks. So in this case, if we, if we run this again, then if we give whatever marks 90, which is actually doesn't fulfill this condition right. So what should, what will be the outcome? There won't be anything printed out because this statement only will be executed if it fulfills this particular statement. Right, we have done this before. So this is what I have uh, just mentioned. The input function actually takes uh, whatever input that we have given and it converts it into string. So we use integer to convert it in the string into integer. Now, uh, if is of course, you can actually use it alone, but the else statement, it has to be used together with the if statement. So we can actually set the first condition and this statement will get fulfilled if it fulfills this condition. Otherwise, automatically it will else. It will uh, execute this particular statement. If the first condition is not true, automatically it will print this statement. So this is what your last work was right, if I remember cor correctly. Some of you also did some extra thing, some extra uh, statement condition so that you can actually check whether the mark, marks is excellent or not excellent. So if you go 50, it's not excellent, right? Because the first condition is, it has to be more or equals to 80, then only you can get excellent. So anything less than 80, which is 79 and below, automatically it will print not excellent. Any question up to this point? We have covered this. Uh, this quite relatively straightforward. Now oh, we are going to look at a nested decision. So nested decision is nothing but you are performing multiple checking. So then it becomes nested decision. So of course, uh, Python allows you to actually perform this kinds of. Uh, complex decisions checking uh, via nested decisions. 
So if you want to perform a nested decisions, then you, you can actually use the if else if else statement. So here, suppose if we want to display a warning if the student marks are greater than 100 or less than zero. Furthermore, we will actually want to show the remarks as follows. Excellent. This is like previously, like how we have done before. Excellent if the marks is 80 or greater. Not excellent if the marks are less than 80. This is what we just did. But now there's an additional condition to give a warning if it's greater than 100 or less than 100. So in this case, you can actually use this uh, nested decision. So you can check for the first expression. Then, like for example, you can actually check uh, if it's greater than 100. If yes, then you can actually execute warning. Now please enter a value between 0 to 100. If, if no, that means, okay, it's within the range, right? Then actually you can check, is it greater than 80? If it's greater than 80, then you print what? Excellent. If it's not greater than 80, then what do you do? You can actually print not excellent. So this is how we can actually do a, a if, else, if, else statement. So type this out, or this is already there for you. Did you notice that for the first one here, the if statement, not necessarily you only have to put one condition. You can actually put multiple condition. Now, this is the same, right? Print input marks of students and of course, we are using the, the function input, but it actually is in string. So we are going to use uh, the function integer to convert it into integer and we assign it to the variable obtain marks, right? Now the first condition that you're checking, you are checking two conditions. If the obtain marks is more than 100, or if the obtain marks is less than zero, then what do you do? You print invalid marks. So what happens when you use or here? Guys, don't worry about typing. Uh, you can actually participate. What is the significance if you use or? If I use n? Sorry? Yes. When you use or, is either. Either one of the condition, if it's fulfilled, then it will print invalid marks. But if you use end, it, it's a wrong logical operator that you're using, right? Because end means both must be true. So in this case, we just want to check either if it's more than 100 or less than 0. If yes, then it prints the statement. Else if, there, there's, there's else, E-L-I-F means else if, else if. Then you're, uh, you're checking for another condition. If the obtain marks is more or equal to 80, then you print excellent. Then else, this is the final one. If it doesn't fulfill this condition, then of course it prints not excellent. So this is if, else, if, else. This is how you can actually perform the nested. So try this out. So if you put 102, so you give invalid marks. If you put 90, you get excellent. And if you put 40, not excellent. This code is not there. Is there? Any question up to this point? On the if, else, if, else? This is on the nested decision making. Can we move on? Uh, guys, are you all here? You all can re respond something. <laughs> Anything that you don't understand? If you don't understand, just let me know. Otherwise, when it comes to assessments, so your test one will be in the first week of March during class time. 
Monday. Okay, next we are going to look at the switch statement. So what we have just seen this now is the multiple complex decision, or nested decision making, right? Now there's another way of uh, a much more easier way for you to actually uh, achieve multiple decision making that is actually by using the switch statement. So as we have seen earlier, if you want to make several decisions, of course, then you can use the if, if else, or if, else, if, else. But in this case, if you want to use the switch statement, it's much more easier. So how we actually define the syntax for the switch is, of course, give the name. Not necessarily this must be the switch. Huh? This is not a reserved keyword. This can be any name. You are just de defining the, the switch statement. The important thing is the equals to curly bracket. And you always have this key and also value. Say case one and value one. Case two, value two. So always the syntax is like this. You always should have the case one, semicolon, value one. Case two, colon, value two. Then you finish it off, close it with uh, closing uh, curly bracket. And if you use a switch get, the case, then you'll be able to get all these case values. So let's say if we want to get, if you want to display one of the seven days of a week, then you can actually type the following. This is already there, right? In your code that I've given to you. So you see, you are defining the switch, switch case with the curly bracket. And also this is the, the key and this is the value. And take note that uh, you must have the comma for every case. So this is the syntax. You have the, the key. And then you have the value in the comma. So let's say if you put switch get. And you're using the get uh, method to actually get the value of the key. So here if you specify phi, which day are you going to get? Yes, you're going to get Friday. So whenever I get, get means you're actually supplying the, the key value. Each key has a value or each case has a value. So what you have to put here is you have to put the case value. Whenever, yes. Switch. Uh-huh. Uh, right, the one to seven. Okay. It doesn't need to be an integer, right? No, no. It doesn't have to be integer. But whatever name that you're actually specifying here, then you should also specify here. So let's see if you change this to... Oh, it is expecting. Uh, I try to define this. Okay, it's only expecting integer. Mm, sorry, this the switch is only expecting. Uh, uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Correct. So the case can be anything. But when I just type A, it actually refers to variable. So you have to assign it as a string. So this is on the switch case and you need to define the key value here.
Okay, so this is what we have actually just seen. Uh, whatever the case name could be there, and you can actually use it to refer to the switch case. <clears throat> now, if you look at this, the syntax of this switch, it has somewhat of a similar uh, syntax like a dictionary. So dictionary we will see later towards the end of the class. Just, just uh, look at the switch statement. See the switch statement has the switch uh, the the switch case and also the the value right. Dictionary also has the same kind of uh, attributes. So we will see that later towards the end of the class. So of course, uh, the switch statement is is quite straightforward like this. It has the switch case and also the value. Uh, but a dictionary, you can actually have a collection of multiple items, as we will see that later. But it has the almost similar kind of syntax, which has the key and also the value. Is that okay? Next, we are moving on to the for loop. <clears throat> so whatever that we have conditional statement that we have seen before is on taking multiple decisions and a nested decision. And also in a complex way, you can, in an easier way, you can also use a switch statement. And sometimes, uh, of course, definitely in, your, in programming, you want to perform certain uh, loops, number of iteration. So for that, we can actually use this for loop. Now, this is just something that you have actually seen before in C programming and also in microcontroller, right? The for loop function. So the syntax is, of course, you use the for and whatever the loop variable. So this is for loop variable is whatever variable that you want to define. So usually you define I and in C programming, you always need to initialize the loop variable, right? You need to initialize it i equals to zero. Then you need to set the condition. Then you increment the loop variable. But in Python, you don't have to do that. So the syntax of Python is you set the for and you define the loop variable. So you can actually name whatever the loop variable i, j, k, or things like that in this is, a, this is how the syntax works. Huh? Loop variable is something you have defined and input variable. So you specify what is the input variable and then you write the statement. So again, the important thing here is the statement to be executed or to be indented. So same thing like the if, uh, the switch and also, sorry, if and also the for. So here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the loop variable in, in Python, you don't have to define, you don't have to initialize it. Then you may ask, then how do we know how many times the loop going to run, right? So the number of times the loop runs depends on the input variable. How many elements are there in the input variable? So for example, look at this one. This one is empty for you, right? You have to type. Am I correct? Now, for your information, what, what you're doing here in the first line is known as a list. This is, you are creating a list. Take note that this is a list. How do you know it's a list? You're using a square bracket. Square bracket. So we will see later, we will see list, we will see uh, a tuple, we will see dictionary, we will see set. And as a homework, I'll give you all something to do also. So how do we actually create a list? You define a variable and equals to square bracket, square bracket. And each item in the list is separated by a comma. 
Is that okay? This is creating a list. So this is the for loop. Say for k, k is what? Is the loop variable. You can give whatever name that you want. In, this is the variable, right? Which is fruits. And you're going to do the statement print k. So it will run through iteration every single line. So what do you think the outcome you'll get? Of course, you'll get all three. Pineapple, orange, and banana. So whenever you're iterating through a list, you don't have to specify the, you don't, first thing, you don't have to initialize uh, the variable. Second, you don't have to actually set when it should stop because you are iterating in through the entire list. Everyone managed to get this? And don't worry about the list. We will actually be saying the list. Just for now, this is how you create the list by using the square bracket. Everyone managed to get? So, as I mentioned, fruit is actually the input variable, right? And it's a list of three fruit items. And the loop runs for how many times? Three. Why? Because the items stored in the list is only three. It automatically runs. Now, there is another useful uh, function which is known as the range that you can actually use in a for loop to generate Sorry, excuse me hello 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 sorry about that What was I saying? Okay, yeah. So there's another function that you can use. This is uh, range. And you can actually set uh, what range of numbers that you want to generate. So, So you can actually do this for j, j is actually loop variable in the range. So now you're not specifying, you're not specifying the, the input variable, you're specifying using the, fun, uh, the function range and you're, you're defining 10. So here in this case for range, whatever value that you mention inside, it means that it is minus 1. So that means it will generate number from 0 until, what number? Until which number? 9. So it actually generates from 0 until 9. Right? So that is how we actually use the range. Another one. Now if you can use the step size. So you can use the range. Remember how the, the syntax for range and step size is? So now you're using the for loop. Of course, you are defining the loop variable as x and you are setting the range. 2 means what? Starting. This one. End point is minus, minus 1. You're taking a step of so what are the numbers that you should generate? 2, then 5, yes, very good. Everyone able to get this right? Why we get it 2, 5, 7, 8?
And whenever we are actually running in an iteration, especially in a loop, these two statements comes in handy. Actually, I've seen this also before. I just break and continue. You don't see this in if else. This is only for the continuous loop statement. So break means it actually forces the uh, I mean, sorry. It actually forces to go out of the loop. And continue means it will continue. So here you can have a very good example. Now before you don't execute this yet, first, what is this? It's a list. Very good. It's a list. So how many items you have? One, two, three, four, five, right? Now here you're doing the iteration for K in fruits. If K equal to banana, don't run this, huh? Don't run this yet. I want you all to think. You continue. Or you print K. If K is equals to melon, then you break. So now let's go through this iteration one by one. So first K will take pineapple, right? Is pine pineapple equals to banana? So will it execute this? Will it execute this statement? So what it will do? It will print K. Did you notice that this print is not indented as continue? Did you notice that? This print K is not indented as continue. When it's not indented as continue, it means that this continue statement only will be executed if it fulfills this condition. This print K is not linked to this if. Got the idea? So it will print pineapple. Right? Then you check if K equal to melon. Is pineapple equal to melon? Is it? No. So it won't execute this break. So you'll go to the for loop. Next is orange. Is orange equal to banana? No. So it won't do the continue right. So it'll print. Okay, it's not melon, so it won't break. Now it comes to banana. Is banana equals to banana? Yeah. So continue. So continue means, will it print? No. Yeah. Next have melon. If K equals to melon, what happens? Break. Break, break means what? It goes out from the loop, right? So finally, what do you have? Only pineapple, orange, and why we are having this melon? Can anyone explain why melon? This one, here, here, the yeah. sprint K. The sprint K is actually, it prints the melon and then it checks if K equal to melon, then it breaks. So when it breaks, it goes out from this for loop. So that's why dates is not printed at all. Everyone able to understand this? How we actually got this? Meaning of continue and also break. So this is what our discussion that we actually we did. And uh, you can also use the for loop with the else statement at the end to indicate already reach the end of the <coughs> loop. Like for example, this. For i in numbers, of course, again, this is what? What is this? List. Yeah. Earlier, it was a list of strings. Now, it's a list of numbers. The same thing. For i in numbers, you print i. So this loop will run until the end, right? So once it, it actually executes until the end, then what will it do? 
it will execute the else and it will print no items left. So you can use, this is something different also. On Python, you can actually use the else with the for. Remember that this for loop runs in this condition. The length of the number of items in numbers. So as long as it fulfills this, then it will print. Otherwise, then it will print out this no items left. So we have seen the for loop. Another one is, of course, the famous one is the while loop. So while loop, it has this particular kind of statement. While and you set the condition inside. Again, the same thing, colon and also the tab. Oops, sorry. So here, let's say there's an, an example. We want to add natural numbers. Natural numbers mean 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Natural numbers up to 10. So you can actually use the while loop for this example. So here's normal. Here, what we are doing, we are actually defining the integer input. And what we have, uh, what we are doing now is we are now putting it in straight away in one line. Did you notice that? This one. Earlier we used to like print enter an integer equals to, and then we actually use n equals to integer input, right? But this is another way that is much more easier. You can actually do it in one single line. So you can define the input and straight away you can put the string value, what you want to actually print it out. And of course, you'll capture that value. So whatever value that uh, the user is actually entering, and then it will start to add to that number. So here you can see, uh, sorry, uh, start adding up to that number. So let's say if the user enters uh, 5, so 5 will be captured in n right. So natural numbers means you are adding from 1 until whatever number that, this is from 1 to 10, so whatever value that you specify, let's say 5, so you'll keep on adding 1 until the 5. So here, you, you the usage of while, you are setting the conditions here. Again, the indentation, the earlier one, sorry, I, uh, I, I couldn't, uh, I forgot to put the indentation here. But all the, this kind of uh, loops, iteration, all must be indented. So of course, you define sum as 0, and then you define k as 1, because you're going to start adding from the value 1 until the value that the user has specified. So in this case, while k, which is the number that you want to keep on adding, if it's less or equals to n, then what do you do? Sum equals to sum plus k. Is there another way that we can write this? Do you remember? Yes, sum plus equals k. Same thing. And same thing here also. Here you're updating the counter. When you already added 1 to the, the sum, then you want to increase the k, right, by 1. Uh, you are able to follow, right, what what we are actually doing here. And then you will keep on doing the while. Now k is actually 2. So assuming, let's say, if this is the number of n is 5. So the first value is 1. 1 plus 0, the sum is 1. Then you increase the k by plus 1, so it becomes 2. Is k less or equals to 5? Yes, right. So you'll add k to sum. So it's now 1 plus 2. Then k plus 1. So it's now k of 2, right? So now plus 1 becomes 3. Is it less or equals to 5? Yes. So it'll add. Increase. Now it becomes 4. Add. 5. Then when it becomes 5, you add. Then when it plus, that becomes 6. It 
no longer fulfills this condition right then it will print so this is the end value which is you mentioned 5 and it will give the sum now take note that this is another way that you can straight away print your statement together with the variable so did you notice this the double quote is whatever string that you want to display then if you want to uh, remember earlier we, we have seen that whenever you use print function we can actually keep on adding strings right just by using comma but here we are not adding strings and whenever you use comma aut automatically it gives the space it adds the space in between so whenever here we're using comma n is actually the variable so it will display the variable and then comma you continue with string comma variable So let's say 5, do you see, this is string, it joins together with the variable, string join together with the variable. So you don't have to do like the C programming, you have to put the, the percentage D or I and then you can put some, you don't have to do that, straight away you can actually mention it. This one, is it there or you all have to type? There also. Any question on this? The whole idea is to show how the while loop actually functions. Of course, uh, you'll get an error if the entered number is not type integer. Why? Because this is, you're converting this into integer type, right? So if you put value like 5.5 .5 float, then of course you'll get an error. So you can try, you get an error. So next we are looking at the nested loops. So we are looking at the iteration of if, else, if, the nested, uh, if, else, if, else. And then we looked at the, the for loops. And then we look at the while loops. And now we are looking at nested loops. So not necessarily this for and while loop, there has to be only a single loop. You can actually use it uh, within uh, each other. So whenever you're using a nested loop, that means you're working with two variables in two dimension. So example, here you have two lists. This is you have to type right. You have to type something. Now don't run this yet. I want you to go through this with me. So here you see this is a nested for like nested for loop. So how does this for loop works? For J in properties. So now we are looking at properties. We look in the first item right in property. So for J in property. And then for K in fruits. Print J K. So what do you think the output will be? Is referring to the properties J first for the red item property you're going to iterate K in fruits so what do you think that you'll get here yes you'll get red apple red orange red banana because you are referring to the first loop and then the first item you're going to iterate in the second one. So this is the nested loop. And then what happened to J? It'll go to the next one, which is round. And for K in fruits, what will do? This J will remain the same, right? But this K will be going through apple, orange, banana. Then you're going to change the J to tasty. Then for K in fruits. So the J here remains 
tasty but the k will change apple orange banana so how many total outputs you'll get nine able to follow okay we're not look, going to look at functions open the other file data storage so this is what i mentioned earlier so we have actually come across uh, integer float and also string types right so these are the various types of data types so far that we have used right but now there is another data types and these are all all very important data types uh, which can actually you can use to store multiple uh, elements and you can use it to store alphabets numbers uh, alphanumeric whatever special characters and these are the four collection data types so these are the important data types and this is important for you all to know huh? this will be assessed as well so the first thing is the list just now we have seen right the list now take note that list is an ordered collection ordered collection means it has index you can use index to assess to each one of those location and what is the second keyword it is changeable you can actually swap whatever the content of the list you can change <coughs> and it also allows duplicate entries so you can have duplicate entries in a list it's not an issue and then you have a tuple now this is also an ordered collection which means it has index you can actually use specify the index but what is the difference it is unchangeable you can't change it once you create a tuple you cannot change the element inside the tuple but of course there, there are ways on how we can actually do that and it also allows duplicate entries you can have the same duplicate entry in one tuple or list it doesn't, doesn't matter right you have the same duplicate things so these are the two list and tuple they are both ordered but one is changeable one is unchangeable how you define them also slightly different list you actually use square bracket <coughs> tuple you use uh, round bracket and then you have set now set is unordered and unindexed which means it doesn't have index and each time when you go through the set not necessarily it'll come out in the same order and in the set it doesn't allow duplicate entry we will see that later maybe on monday and finally you have dictionary this is what earlier i mentioned that you know something similar like the switch statement it has this almost similar kind of syntax syntax but dictionary also is unordered means you can't use index on it but you can change it and you can use the index collection of entries index collection of entry means what like earlier when you have the switch statement you have the case right you use that case index like one two this now friday means we use the the case index which is five to get the entry right so that is what it means by the index collection of entries it's not by using the index number not zero one two three yeah, the, you can't use that that you can only use in list and also in tuple okay so it's 11 50 so we couldn't go any further but as a homework i want you all to come up with a comparison table uh, with this four list tuple set and dictionary so take note of the points what is the syntax used for example is it a square bracket curly bracket or round bra bracket i'll also will put in the telegram any questions that you have up to this point i'll stop the recording for now